This audio program is presented by Audible.com. Audible, audio that speaks to you wherever you are. Five have a mystery to solve. By Enid Blyton. Julian, Dick, and Anne were back home for the Easter holidays. They had been planning to spend the day at Kirin with George and Timmy, but their mother said they couldn't because a certain Mrs. Layman was coming to tea, and she wanted to see them about something. So instead of going to Kirin, Anne phoned George and invited her and Timmy over to see them. Now the three of them were off shopping for food, cycling along the lane to the village. It was a truly Lovely spring day. Dick burst into song as they went, and the cows in the nearby fields lifted their heads in surprise as Dick's loud voice swept round them. Anne laughed. It was good to be with her brothers again. She missed them very much when she was at school, and now they would have almost a month together with their cousin George. She was suddenly overwhelmed with joy. And lifted up her voice and joined Dick in his singing. Now let's all be happy. Her brothers looked at her with affection and amusement. Good old Anne, you're such a quiet little mouse. It's nice to hear you sing so loudly. I am not a quiet little mouse. What makes you say that? Just wait. You may get a surprise one day. Yes, we may, but I doubt it. A mouse can't suddenly turn into a tiger. Anyway, one's quite enough. George is the tiger of our family. She can roar and rant and rave. Oh, oh, stop teasing! Anyway, here's the butcher's. You go and get the sausages and a nice meaty bone for Timmy, and I'll go and buy the cakes. I hope the old lady, what's her name, Layman, who's coming to tea today, has a good appetite. I wonder what she's coming to tell us about. Yes, I wonder. George and Timmy were waiting for Julie and Dick and Anne when they arrived home. Timmy was standing in the road, ears pricked, long tail waving. He went quite mad when he saw their bicycles rounding the corner and galloped towards them at top speed, barking madly. George heard Timmy barking and ran out into the road too. The three cycled up to her and she grinned happily at them. Shopping, I see. Oh, shut up, barking Timmy. Sorry you couldn't come over to Kirin Cottage, but I'm jolly glad you asked me to come to you. My father still hasn't found some papers he's lost, and the place is like a madhouse. Cupboards turned out everywhere. Talk about a mess. He's probably put the papers in the waste paper basket by mistake. Gracious! I never thought of that. <laughs> Who's this Mrs. Layman who's coming to tea? Have we got to stay in and have tea with her? Afraid so. Apparently she's coming to talk to us about something. So you'd better be on your best behaviour, George. Ha! Come on now. We'd all better get indoors before Timmy gets some of the cakes out of the bags. Stop licking that bag, Tim. You'll make a hole in it. He can smell the cherry buns inside. Well, he's not having one. Come on. The morning went very pleasantly. After George had said hello to her aunt. The five went down to the beach and walked round the high cliffs, and Timmy raced after every seagull that dared to sit on the sand. When tea time came, they all felt quite ready for it and were most impatient when Mrs. Layman was late. But then the front door bell rang, and in came a cheerful, smiling old lady, nodding to everyone, very pleased to see such a nice little party waiting for her. They all sat down to tea. And soon the bread and butter, the sandwiches, the buns, the cakes, and everything else had disappeared. Timmy sat quietly by George, who slipped him a titbit now and again when no one was looking. Mrs. Layman chatted away. She was a most interesting person. Well, now I'm sure you must be wanting to know why I asked to come to tea today. I wanted to ask your mother, Julian. If there was any chance of you three and this other boy here, what's his name, 
George, would you like to help me out of a little difficulty? Nobody pointed out that George was a girl, not a boy, and that George was short for Georgina. George, as usual, was pleased to be taken for a boy. They all looked at Mrs. Lehman, listening to her with interest. It's like this. I've a dear little house up on the hills overlooking the harbour. And I've a grandson staying with me there, Wilfred. Well, I have to go and look after this cousin of mine who's ill. And Wilfred can't bear to be left alone. So I just wondered if your mother would allow you children to share the little house with Wilfred and, well, keep him company. Otherwise, all he'll see is the woman who comes in to cook and clean. You mean that lovely little house with the wonderful view? Yes, but it's rather primitive in some ways. No water, just a well. And no electricity or gas, just candles or an oil lamp. Maybe it sounds too old-fashioned for words, but that view makes up for it, I think. Perhaps the children would like to come over and see it before they decide. Well, we'll certainly come and see it. And if the children feel they like it, they can stay. Yes, we'll come and see it, Mrs. Lehman. Mother's going to be busy with the bazaar soon, so she'll be glad to get us out of the way I expect. Oh, tomorrow then, about ten o'clock. Oh, uh, yes. Next day, the children prepared to go and see the cottage. Julian's mother decided not to come after all. She had rather a lot to do. So the four of them set off on their bicycles, with Timmy running alongside. They went along a road that ran along the top of a hill. They swung round a corner, and there, spread far below them, was a great sea vista that included a wonderful harbour. The sea was as blue as the Mediterranean, and quite breathtaking. Anne jumped off her bicycle at once. I must feast my eyes on all this before I go any further. What a view! Hmm, it's fantastic! Oh, what's that? It's a golf ball. Don't pick it up. Whoever's playing with it has to come and hit it from exactly where it fell. Good thing you weren't hit, Anne. I didn't realise this gate led onto the golf course. Funny game, really. Just hitting a ball all round the course. Wish I had some clubs. I'm sure I could hit some smashing shots. Well, if the cottage is anywhere near this golf course, perhaps you could pay to have a lesson. Let's get going anyway, you two. We have to look for a small white cottage with Hill Cottage painted on it. It's on the hillside facing the sea. All right, George, we're coming. Soon they were all riding along the road again, and it wasn't long before they came to a funny old cottage. It's back to them, its front looking down the steep hill that ran towards the great harbour and the sea beyond. The cottage had a wooden door, hung rather crooked, with an old brass knocker. Julian knocked, but nobody came to open it. He knocked again, and then opened the door. It opened straight into a room that looked like a kitchen. It was old, very old. Ancient oil lamps stood on two tables. A narrow, crooked stairway curved up to the floor above. Julian went up and found himself in a long, darkish room, its roof thatched with reed and held up by black beams. Then, as he came back down the stairs, the front door was flung open and someone came in. What are you doing here? This is my cottage. Uh, are you Wilfred by any chance? Yes, I am. And who are you? And where's my grandmother? She'll soon chuck you out. Is your grandmother Mrs. Lehman? If so, she asked us to come and see the cottage and decide if we'd like to keep you company. Well, I don't want you, so clear off. I thought there was a lady who looks after you too. Where's she? She only comes in the morning. She left me some food. Then I sent her off, and you can clear off too. Don't be an idiot, Wilfred. You can't live here on your own. You're just a kid. I shan't be living on my own. I've got plenty of friends. You can't have plenty of friends in here in this lonely place. Well, I have. And here's one, so look out. <gasps> a snake! <laughs> it's all right, Anne. It's only a harmless grass snake. 
Put it back in your pocket, Wilfred, and don't play the fool. If that snake is the only friend you have, you'll be pretty lonely here by yourself. Come out here on the hillside and see some of my friends, if you don't believe me. They all trooped out of the little cottage onto the hillside, amazed at this fierce, strange boy. He ordered them to sit down and be quiet. Then he pulled from his pocket a little musical pipe. He put it into his mouth and began to whistle. There was no tune, no melody, just a kind of beautiful dirge. Anne thought it sounded very sad. A moment later, something stirred a little way down the hill, and then, to everyone's surprise, an animal appeared, a hare. It lolloped right up to Wilfrid and began to dance. The tune changed a little, and a rabbit appeared. Then another and another. A bird flew down, a beautiful magpie. And then Timmy went gently over to Wilfrid, lay down, and put his head on the boy's knee. Wilfrid fondled Timmy's head. Timmy, come here. Timmy, that's it, there, boy. I've decided you can come and stay in my cottage after all, if you bring that dog too. There aren't many dogs like him. He's a wonderful dog. I'd like him for one of my friends. Where are you going? Down the hill to see some more of my friends. Well, what do you make of that? I think we should thank Timmy. We certainly wouldn't have had this lovely little cottage if he hadn't made friends with Wilfred. What a funny boy he is! Very peculiar, if you ask me. I'm not sure I like him one bit. Don't be silly, George. He must have a wonderful love for animals. They would never come to him as they did if they didn't trust him absolutely. Anyone who loves animals as he does must be all right. I bet I could make them come to me if I had that pipe. Of course you could, George. <laughs> I could too. Stop arguing, you two. Let's go back inside. It's such a lovely little cottage, isn't it? I'm really going to enjoy it here. Well, we'll have to go back home and collect a few clothes and other things. We can shop on the way back. Hello. It sounds as if someone's inside. How could Wilfred have got back in without us seeing him? Oh, it's you, Mrs. Layman. Hello. I thought I'd pop over to see if you liked Hill Cottage. Do we? You bet. And if it's all right, we'd like to move in today. We can easily go home and bring back anything we need. It's a glorious old place, isn't it? And the view must be the finest anywhere. Well, that harbour is the second biggest natural harbour in the whole world. The only one that is any bigger is Sydney Harbour. So you have something to feast your eyes on, Julian. I'd say. I just wish I could paint. Where's Wilfred, by the way? Is he behaving himself? He's rather a difficult boy at times. Oh, don't you worry about Wilfred. He'll have to toe the line and do as he's told. He's a wonder with animals, though. Yes, I suppose he is. Though I can't say I like pet snakes or beetles and things. <gasps> don't stand any nonsense from him. We shan't. And thanks for letting us have the cottage, Mrs. Layman. We'll take great care of everything. I know you will. Well, goodbye, children. Give Wilfred my love, and I hope he doesn't fill the cottage with animals of all kinds. Bye. Bye. Later, Julian, Dick, and George, and Timmy. Went off to their homes to collect the things they needed, leaving Anne to tidy up the cottage and sort everything out. She had just cleaned out the larder and collected a bucket of water from the well when Wilfred appeared. He pushed her aside and went into the cottage, saying he was hungry. He opened the larder door and took down a tin. There was a cake inside, and he cut off a huge piece. He didn't offer Anne any. Couldn't you have cut me a piece too? You really are a rude boy, you know. I like being rude, especially to people who come to my cottage when I don't want them. Oh, don't be so silly! It isn't your cottage; it belongs to your grandmother. She told us so. Anyway, you said we could stay if Timmy stayed too. I'll soon make Timmy my dog. You'll see. Soon you won't want that gold George any more, and he'll follow at my heels day and night. You'll see. <laughs> You've got to be joking! Don't you dare laugh at me. I'll call up my grass snake and my adder. Then you'll run for miles. Oh no, I won't. Just watch yourself run. What are you doing with that bucket? 
You'll see. You wouldn't dare. Oh, no. No. Ah! <laughs> That'll teach you to mind your manners. Anne, what on earth's going on? Julian, when did you get back? Just now. The others are on their way. But what's Wilfred been doing? That girl, that bad, wicked girl. She's like a tiger. She sprang on me and threw the buckets of water all over me. I won't let her stay in my cottage. <laughs> so the mouse has turned into a tiger. Anne, let me see if you've grown claws. Oh, Julian, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have soaked Wilfred. But he was so irritating, I lost my temper. All right, all right. It's quite a good thing to do sometimes, and I bet young Wilfred deserved it. You'd better change out of those wet things, Wilfred. You heard what I said, Wilfred. Jump to it. Go and change. Oh, Wilfred, uh, I'm sorry. Truly I am. I don't know why I turned into a tiger so suddenly. I'm sorry too. You're nice. Now where's he gone? Let him be for a while. This will do him good. Nothing like having a bucket of cold water flung over you to make you see things as they really are. He was probably touched when you said you were sorry. He's probably never apologised to anyone in his life before. And after that, Wilfred was nicer to everyone. He was most polite to both the girls. And, as Dick said, he didn't throw his weight about nearly so much. They all settled down very well together in the cottage. They had most of their meals out of doors, sitting on the warm grass. It was glorious out in the sun high up on their hill. They could look down on the harbour and enjoy the wonderful views all around. George was very curious about the island that lay in the middle of the harbour. What's it called, Wilfred? That island? Don't know. There's a strange story about it. Really? What? Well, it belonged to a lonely old man. He lived in a big house in the middle of a wood. The island was given to his family by a king. James II, I think. This old man was the very last one of his family, and people kept wanting to buy his island. And he had some kind of watchman to keep people from landing on it. These watchmen were pretty fierce. They had guns. Gosh, did they shoot people who tried to land then? Well, they were shot to frighten them off, not to hurt them, I suppose. Anyway, a lot of sightseers had an awful fright when they tried to land. Is there anyone there now? I don't think so. But I don't know an awful lot about it. I tell you who does, though. One of the groundsmen on the golf course called Lucas. He was once one of the watchmen himself. It might be rather interesting to talk to him. I fancy a walk over to the golf course anyway. Well, let's go now. Timmy's longing for a good long walk, aren't you, Timmy? So the five, with Wilfred too, went up the hill, crossed over the road that ran along the top, and climbed over a stile. They found themselves on one of the fairways of the golf course, not far from a green in which stood a pole with a bright red flag. Wilfred led them down the hill towards where a man was trimming up a ditch. It was Lucas. His face was as brown as a well-ripened nut, and his arms and shoulders were even browner. He wore no shirt or vest, and his dark, deep-set eyes twinkled as they took in the five children and the dog. Hello there, young Wilfred. <laughs> you brought some friends with you, I see. Yes, this is Julian, Dick, George and Anne. Hello. How do you do? Oh, and Timmy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm very pleased to meet you all. Now, to what do I owe this pleasure? We came to ask you something about the island in the harbour. What's its name? And does anyone live there now? We can see it from the cottage at the top of the hill. It looks awfully quiet and lonely. And so it is. <laughs> Do you want me to tell you all about it? Oh, yes, oh, yes. yes. Well, now, that island's always been a mystery place. It's called Wailing Island by some folks on account of how the wind makes a right strange wailing noise around its cliffs. And others call it Whispering Island, because it's full of trees that whisper in the wind. But most of us call it Keep Away Island, and that's the best name of all, for there's never been a welcome there, what with the dark cliffs, the cruel rocks, and the dense woods. 
Tell us about the rich old man who hated everyone, Lucas. Uh, I'm telling the story my own way. <laughs> Be patient now, or I'll start my ditching again. Sit like this dog, you see. He doesn't twitch a muscle. Good dog, that is. I know. Uh, yes, now, where was I? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, about this rich old man. He was so afraid of being robbed that he bought that lonely island. And he built himself a great castle right in the middle of the thick woods. Cut down about a hundred trees to make way for it, he did. Were you alive then? Bless you, boy. No, of course not. Long before my time, that was. Well, the stone house or castle, call it what you like, was built. And the old man brought to it all kinds of treasures. Beautiful statues, some of gold, it was said. A wonderful sword worth a king's fortune. And other things uh, I can't remember. And what happened to all these things? Well, now, he, he fell foul of the king of the land, and one morning, what did he see landing on the shores of his island? But ships of all kinds, and men from those ships, they stormed the stone castle and killed the old man and all his servants. Did they find the treasures the old man had collected? Not one thing. Some say it was all a tale. The old man never did have any wonders there. I, I think it's all a yarn myself, but, but a good yarn at that. So who owns the island now? Well, an old fellow and his wife went to live there, and they didn't care for anything except for the birds and animals there. It was they who kept the gamekeepers and guns to frighten away sightseers. They wanted peace and quiet to themselves and for all the wildlife on the island. Fine idea, too. <laughs> Many a time I was there with the other keepers, three of us there were, and I'd have had rabbits gambling over my feet, the birds tame as canaries. I'd love to go there. Can anyone go there now? No, not a soul has lived in the old stone castle since the old fellow and his wife fell ill and died. The place is empty. The island belongs to a great nephew of the old couple now, but he never goes there. Just keeps a couple of men on the island to frighten up visitors. And pretty fierce they are, so I've been told. Well, there you are. That's the story of Whispering Island. Not very pleasant. But it belongs to the birds and the beasts now, and good luck to them. Thank you for telling us the story. A pleasure. Yeah. Well, I'll be off to my hedging and ditching now. That's happiness enough for anyone. <laughs> and it's a pity more folks don't know it. <laughs> Goodbye. The children walked round the golf course together after talking to old Lucas. Suddenly, Timmy darted into the bracken and came out with something in his mouth. It was a golf ball, fairly new. Timmy found five more balls after that, and soon Julian's pockets were heavy with them. They made their way to the small clubhouse in the distance, meaning to give in the balls. It was set in a little dip and looked friendly and welcoming. They all went in at the door, and Julian walked over to one of the golfers who was checking some scorecards. He emptied his pockets of balls and grinned. A present from our dog. Oh, my words. Did you find all those? Mm. Not bad ones, either. I'll stand you all some lemonade. Will you have some? Oh, yes, please. Here we are, then. Help yourselves. Thanks. So, uh, where are you from, then? We're staying in that little cottage up on the hillside. Do you know it? Hill cottage? Of course I do. My grandmother lived there once upon a time. Lovely view, too. One of the finest in the world, I reckon. You can see Whispering Island from there, too. Mind you, it ought to be called Mystery Island. It's said that folks have gone there and never come back. What happened to them? Oh, maybe it's all a tale. There's supposed to be priceless things there, packed away somewhere. And collectors from all over the world have come here and tried to get over to the island. Not to steal, but to see if they could find anything worthwhile and buy it for museums or their own collections. It's even said there are statues in the wood white as snow. And didn't the collectors come back? It said a lot of them didn't. But that may be silly tales. What I do know is that two men came down here from some museum in London and hired a boat to go across. 
They took a white flag with them so the keepers wouldn't shoot them. And after that, nobody heard a word about them. They just disappeared. Well, what happened to them? Nobody knows. Their boat was found miles out to sea, drifting and empty. Didn't the police do anything? Oh, yes. They uh, went across to the island, but the keepers swore they'd seen nobody arriving and they were the only people on the place. The police landed and searched everywhere, but they found nothing except the great castle-like house in the woods oh, and uh, hundreds of animals so tame they'd sit and watch you as you walked by. All very mysterious. Well, thanks for the welcome lemonade. We'd already heard a bit from a groundsman of yours, Lucas, a real old countryman. Oh, Lucas. <laughs> yes, he knows the island well. He was once one of the keepers, you know. Well, come and see me again sometime. Oh, and uh, thanks for the balls. It isn't everyone who's honest enough to come and give them in when they find them. All right, bye-bye. Bye, thank you. They all said goodbye and went out. Timmy ran off into the bracken again, hunting for more golf balls. The others went to walk up the hill, talking about the island. I wonder what really did happen to those two collector men. Funny their boat was found adrift and empty. They must have been drowned, of course. I just wonder if anything is left of their old treasures. No, there wouldn't be. The police would have made a very thorough search. I wish we could go to the island. I don't expect the keepers would shoot at us, would they? That's very wishful thinking, George. We're certainly not going near that island, so put that idea right out of your head. Well, I knew it was impossible, really. But wouldn't it be a grand adventure if we managed to get on this mysterious, whispering island and explore it without the keepers knowing? Not such a grand adventure if we were all peppered with shot. Anyway, we wouldn't find anything of interest. The treasure must have been removed ages ago. The only possible thing of interest would be the tame wild creatures there. Wilfred would go mad with joy, wouldn't you, Wilfred? I'd like it very much. What's more, I might hire a boat myself and row to the island to see if I can spot any animals. You'll do nothing of the sort, so don't try any silly tricks, see? I shan't promise. You just never know. Oh, yes, I do. You're just trying to sound big. Anyway, come along, everyone. It's past our dinner time, and I'm ravenous. As usual, they took their lunch out on the hillside. It was lovely sitting there watching the boats in the harbour and seeing the beautiful white-sailed yachts bending to and fro in the strong wind that blew there. They could all see Whispering Island quite clearly and noticed that no boats went anywhere near it. Of course, there might be badgers there. I've never really been close to a badger. I shouldn't think anyone but you would want to be. Smelly things. That's one thing you can't call with your whistle pipe. There aren't any here. Wilfred, get out your pipe and make the little rabbits come again. Would they? Yes, I think so. Now where did I put it? What? My pipe. It's gone. I must have lost it. It must be in one of your pockets. It's not, I tell you. I've never had another one like it. Never. I'm sorry for poor Wilfred, aren't you? No, I'm not. Serves him right. I hope he never finds his silly pipe. That'll teach him not to try and get Timmy away from me. Oh, don't be silly. He does it for fun. He's your dog and nobody, nobody else's. Wilfred's only teasing you when he tries to get Timmy to go to him. Timmy goes, though, doesn't he? And he shouldn't. He shouldn't. He can't help it. Wilfred has some peculiar attraction for animals, and that little whistle pipe of his is like a magic call to them. I'm glad it's gone. Glad, glad, glad. I think you're silly and unkind. I'm going back to the others. Where's Wilfred gone, Dick? To look for his precious pipe. He's really heartbroken about it. He says he's going to walk all the way back to the golf course and hunt for it. Poor old Wilfred. He won't be able to call the wild animals to him anymore. I suppose old George doesn't know anything about it. That's a mean thing to say. But George might have found it and kept it just for a joke. No, no, I don't think she'd do that. It would be a very poor joke. Well, we'll just have to hope he finds it. 
What are you going to do this afternoon, Julian? <laughs> sleep, by the look of you. Yes, sleep out in the warm sun. Then I'm going for a walk down to the harbour. I might even have a bathe. We'll all go. Oh, how lovely it is to feel lazy and warm and well-fed and so sleepy. The two boys and Anne and George slept soundly in the sun until just past three o'clock. Then, carrying their bathing things, they made their way down the hill across a stretch of moorland to the edge of the sea. Timmy running joyously behind them. They had a wonderful time in the water. The waves were big and curled over like miniature waterfalls, sweeping the children along with them. It was an ideal day for bathing. When they came out, they lay on the sand in the sun for a while. Then Julian saw a notice not far off, which said, Boats for hire. Inquire at hut. A boy of about 15 sat there, renting out the boats, and he told them it worked out cheaper to take one by the week, and that's what they decided to do. The boat they chose was one called Adventure. A jolly good name for a boat of theirs, said Dick. And soon they were in the boat, bobbing about on the waves. Julian took the oars and pulled it out to sea. Now they were in the full breeze, and a strong one it was too. The tide was running out, and pulled the boat strongly out to sea. Whispering Island suddenly seemed very much nearer. Better look out! We don't know if a keeper's on guard somewhere on the shore of the island. We're getting pretty near. But the outgoing tide swept the boat on and on towards the island, so that very soon they could see a sandy shore. Dick took one oar and Julian the other, and they tried to row against the tide and take the boat back into calm water. It was no good. The tide was far too strong. Very soon the boat was quite near the shore of the island. And then an enormous wave flung them right up the sand and left the boat grounded as it went out again. The boat slid over to one side and they all promptly fell out. Phew! What a tide! I had no idea it ran so strongly. What shall we do? We'll just have to stay on the island until the tide turns and we can row back on it. Uh, give me a hand to pull the boat a bit further up the beach. Uh, come on! Uh. Listen! The trees are really whispering. It's as if they were talking to each other. No wonder it's called Whispering Island. I don't like it much. It's just the noise of the whispering. Well, what shall we do before the tide turns? Shall we explore? After all, we've got Timmy with us. No one is likely to attack us if they see him. They've got guns, haven't they? I think you're right. Keep your hands on Timmy's collar, George. You know what I think? I think we ought to try and find the guards and tell them the tide swept us onto the island, quite by accident. We're not grown-ups come to snoop around, so they're sure to believe us and would be safe from chasing or shooting then. Yes, good idea. Give ourselves up and ask for help. After all, we hadn't any real intention of actually landing. The tide simply threw our boat into that cove. So they walked up to the back of the cove and into the wood, where the whispering was very loud indeed, once they were actually among the trees. No one was to be seen. Then, after about ten minutes hard walking and climbing, Julian came to a stop. He had seen something through the trees, a great grey wall made of stone. It was a very high wall indeed, but when they came to a corner and peeped round, there was a great courtyard, quite empty. Then suddenly, two enormous men came down a flight of stone steps. 
They looked so fierce that Timmy couldn't help giving a blood-curdling growl. The men stopped short and looked round, wondering where the sound came from. And then, to the children's enormous relief, they raced off in the wrong direction. The five made their way back beside the stone wall through the whispering trees to the cove. We'd better row back as quickly as we can. I think something's wrong here. Those men looked like foreigners. They certainly weren't gamekeepers. I wish we hadn't come. Julian, where's our boat? It's gone. This can't be the right cove. It looks the same cove to me, except the sea has come in a bit more. Do you think it took our boat away? Gosh, look at that wave sweeping in and sucking back. My word, yes. Our boat could easily have been dragged out on a wave like that. It is the same cove. Here are our clothes. Look, we hit them here. What an idiot I am! We should have pulled the boat as far up as we could. I'm cold now. I'm going to dress. It will be easier carrying a bathing suit than a heap of clothes. But the thing is, what are we going to do now? No boat to get back in. And why on earth did we choose one called Adventure? We might have known something would happen. We can't signal, I suppose. With what? You could wave a shirt for an hour, and it wouldn't be noticed. Well, we must think of something. What about trying to find a boat here? Surely those men must have one to get here. Of course. Where are my brains? They seem to be going soft or something. We could snoop round tonight and see if there's a boat anywhere. They may have two or three. Timmy doesn't like this island. He smells danger. I bet he does. But I'm jolly glad he's with us. So am I. Especially with fellows like those two horrible men we saw in the courtyard. I don't think they were merely gamekeepers. They looked like guards of some kind to me. Well, what were they guarding then? That's what I'd very much like to find out. And I think perhaps I'll snoop round a bit and see what I can discover when it's getting dark. I wish I hadn't come. I wish we were safe in our cottage with Wilfred. Oh, I wonder if he's found his whistle pipe. Goodness, it seems ages since we hired that boat. Can't we go quietly through the woods and explore a bit now? I'm getting bored sitting here. Well, I suppose old Tim would give us a warning at once if he heard anyone. So they made their way carefully and silently through the whispering trees once again. Then suddenly, Timmy gave a warning growl, and they all stood still at once. They could hear nothing. They were in a very dense part of the wood. And it was dark and sunless. What was Timmy growling at? Julian went forward as silently as he could. Then he stopped and stared. There was a strange figure gleaming out of the shadows, an arm outstretched as if pointing at something. What is it, Julian? It's like a ghost. I don't like this. <laughs> we'll see. George, come back. Well, how do you do? It's so nice to meet a well-mannered statue. A statue? Of course. Oh yes. Look around you, everyone. The wood's full of statues, and aren't they beautiful? That man at the golf club, the one we took the lost balls to, he said something about statues as white as snow. Do you remember? Yes. They must have stood here for some time. And what about the other stories then? Well, yes. Lucas said there were gold statues too, didn't he? And a sword worth a king's fortune. To think they might all be quite near us, somewhere on Whispering Island. What is it? What do you want, Timmy? Perhaps he's hungry. Thirsty, more likely. Look at his tongue hanging out. Oh, poor Tim! You haven't had a drink for hours. We shall all be thirsty soon. I wonder where we can get some water. Would it be dangerous to go near the castle and see if there's a tap anywhere? Yes, it would. We're not going near any of those men with guns. They might have been told to shoot on sight. We're not that far from the castle now. See, there are the walls, just through those trees. Oh, you're right. I didn't think we'd come so close. What's that ram thing over there then? Where? There, see. I know what that is. It's a well. A well. Let's see if it's got some water in it. It's got a pulley at least, but is there a bucket? 
If there is, we can let it down and fill it for Timmy. I think there is. Yes, down there. I'll let it down. It's awfully stiff. There. Oh, no! Blow. It's suddenly loosened, and now the bucket's jumped off the hook. It'll probably sink now. Is there a ladder down the well? If so, I could shin down and get the bucket. No. I could shin down the rope, though, couldn't I? I'm lighter. Then you and George could turn the handle and pull me up with the bucket. OK. Down you go, then. The rope's good and strong. Right. Down the rope Dick went, hand over hand, just like he did at school in the gym. When he got to the bottom, he took hold of the bucket handle and filled the bucket full, then shouted to be pulled up. It was slow work. Gradually, Dick came up nearer and nearer to the top. When he was halfway up, they heard him give an exclamation and call out something, but they couldn't make out what it was. They reached down and took the bucket from Dick as soon as his head appeared at the top. Timmy fell on it with excited barks and began to lap furiously. Didn't you hear me yelling to you to stop when I was halfway up? What's the excitement? We couldn't make out what you said. I shouted because I saw something quite peculiar as I came up the well. It looked awfully like a little door, an iron door. A door in a well? But where on earth would it lead to? That's what we're going to find out. Who would ever think of putting a door in the side of a well? Somebody did. But why? I rather think I'll go straight down again and see if I can open it. Right, lower me down. Right, stop! Can you see it? Yes, there's a rusty old bolt. There, that's it. No, the door's still jammed. Where's my penknife? What's happening? I'm scraping away some of the rust. Nearly there. Hey. Got it! It's open! What's in it? Can't see! Uh, yes, there's something! What is it? Dick, what can you see? Pull me up! It's too extraordinary for words! Pull me up and I'll tell you! <laughs> now what is it, Dick? Oh, do tell. That door leads to where the treasures are hidden. What? It's true. The first thing I saw was a gold statue staring at me. Brilliant eyes in a gold face. Real gold. There are dozens of them. And what a hiding place. Right under the earth. There must be another entrance to it. The well door must be a secret one. My word, what a find, Dick. No wonder the police could find nothing. We might find the sword there and other treasures. Shh! You'll bring the guards here, you idiot! Stop it! Now what? By the look of his tail, he's recognised something. Or somebody. Wilfred! Hello, everybody. How did you get here? Well, when he didn't come back, I guess something was wrong. But how did you know we were on Whispering Island? The boy in the boats told me you'd taken one. And when it had been reported tossing about empty, I thought, aha, it didn't make the boat fast, and now they're marooned. You were pretty mean to go without me. But I guess you'd be pleased to see me if I borrowed a boat and came over. Now we can go back whenever we want. But we don't want to, not at present. We've made some startling discoveries, Wilfred, and you'll be able to share in them. Uh, what's that in your pocket? Oh, it's only a baby hedgehog. I've got a bag of food here too. Wilfred, you're a marvel. Wilfred had brought tins of tuna and fruit and baked beans, 
a large loaf, and even food for Timmy. They all sat and had a very welcome meal, and then rested in the sun. It was sinking now, but still very bright. Dick began to think of the night, and how he and Julian would snoop round and find the way into that strange place underground, where those golden statues stood silently in the darkness. Then he fell asleep, and only awoke when Anne gave him a friendly punch. He sat up and began talking to his sister. And then Anne suddenly looked round. Where's Wilfred? He must have slipped away without a sound. Now where's he gone? He'll get caught, sure as can be. Good thing Timmy didn't go with him. He might have been caught too, and shot. Oh, Timmy! Timmy would never go with Wilfred if I wasn't there too. Oh, what a little fool he is. Those men will guess there's someone else on the island with Wilfred, won't they? They might even make him tell all he knows, where the boat is and everything. What shall we do? Timmy will track for us. Come on, Tim. Find Wilfred. Find that silly, disobedient boy. <laughs> Not so fast, Timmy. He must have gone in that direction then. I never spotted him slinking away. Listen. What is it? There it is again. Ah! Ah! Let me go! Let me go! Who are you with? Where are they? You are not alone, are you? Quick, we must hide! Up the trees! Good idea. Hurry, everybody. Hurry! But Timmy can't climb. Put him under a bush and tell him to sit. Go on, George, quick. All right. In you go, Timmy, and keep quiet. How did you get here, eh? In a boat. Who was with you? Nobody. I came alone. I wanted to visit the island. I'm an animal lover. A likely story. All right, then. See what I've got in my pocket. What's that? A hedgehog, see? It was trodden on by a horse. I'm looking after it. Very well. You can go back to your boat and row away. At once, mind. We've business of our own here, and we don't want the strangers around. Not even silly little kids with the hedgehogs in their pockets. Wilfred took to his heels and fled. He felt lost now. He would never find the others, or the cove where his boat was. Oh, why had he gone off on his own? He had entirely lost his sense of direction, and had no idea whether to go to the left or right. He began to panic. Where could the others be? He must find them, he must! He thought he heard voices in the distance, and rushed towards the sound. But alas, it died down. It was only the wind. The trees thinned out, and Wilfred suddenly saw the sea in the distance. Good. If he could get to it, he could walk round the shore till he came to his cove. He came to the edge of the cliff and looked down. What was that noise? That awful, dreadful noise? It was like a giant wailing and wailing at the top of his voice. Of course. It's the wading cliffs we were told about. That's all. Nothing to be frightened about. There's somebody down there. Three or four of them too. Mustn't let them see me. What are they doing there? Funny. Now where have they gone? They've just disappeared. Must have gone into a cave. Here they are again, carrying something this time. Boxes. What are they doing? Treasure. That's what it is. They're carrying out the treasure from the castle. I know it. And there's a steamer in the distance. Just wait till I tell the others. But where are the others? Ah! Let me go! Let me go! Timmy! Thank goodness you're here! Save me! <laughs> what on earth? George! And Julian! It was you who grabbed me! I thought it was one of the men! Where have you been, Wilfred? What do you mean by going off on your own like that? I know. I'm sorry. I went off, 
Then a man caught me and scared me. Then I ran away and lost myself. I couldn't find any of you. But I did see something very interesting. What? Let's sit down and I'll tell you. I feel quite shaky. You really are beast to jump on me like that. Never mind, Wilfred. Now go on. Tell us everything that happened. They all listened to Wilfred's story with intense interest. Julian realised that the cave the men had come out of carrying the boxes must be some sort of passage into the cliffs, leading to the underground treasure chamber. It was time they did a bit of exploring, he decided. What's the plan, Julian? I propose we go to the cliffs, the Wailing Cliffs, as soon as it's twilight, and make our way down. Then we'll see if we can find the cave those men came out of. We'd better be on our guard, though. I don't expect to see a soul down there tonight, but you never know. What then? If there is a way through the cliffs, to the underground chamber, where Dick saw the golden statues, we'll be in real luck. We shall then be absolutely certain how things can be taken in and out. Taken in? But I thought they'd been there for ages. They were probably only taken out to sell, smuggled out. I think it may be more than that. It might even be a central clearing ground for a gang of high-class thieves who would hide valuable stolen goods there till it was safe to sell them. I think somebody's discovered the underground chamber full of the old man's treasures and has taken them out bit by bit. Anyway, whatever it is, it's awfully exciting to think we know so much. And all because we went down the well to get some water. Put on your sweaters. It may be freezing cold in the wind round those cliffs. I'm longing to start. This is a real adventure. Do you hear that, Timmy? An adventure. At last they started off and made their way carefully down a cliff path to the rocks below. The tide was out, so the waves didn't splash up and soak them. Wilfred pointed out the cliff where he saw the men disappear, and they all made their way towards it. There they found a dark, slit-like opening in the cliff face. George took firm hold of Timmy's collar and followed Julian, and they all went inside. They found themselves in a passage, which slanted upwards and had a curious little stream flowing down the middle of it. On either side there were uneven ledges, which they walked on. As they climbed higher up the steep passage, they could feel a great draught, so there must be an opening somewhere up ahead. Julian, we've not only gone upwards, we've gone a good way forward too. Wasn't the old castle somewhere in this direction? Yes, I suppose it would be. Gosh, I wonder if this passage comes up in one of its cellars. An old castle like that would have huge cellars, and probably a dungeon or two for prisoners. The wall of the well must run down beside the castle foundation. Shh! Whisper, can't you idiot? You nearly made me jump out of my skin. Sorry. But I think you may be right about the well. The wall in the well, that funny little door was in, was terrifically thick. I bet I was looking into one of the castle cellars when I peeped through it. Oh, look! The passage is getting wider. I think this part was man-made. Look at these old bricks here. Probably put there to strengthen the tunnel. Yes, a secret way from the castle to the sea. Isn't it thrilling? We're coming near the opening where the draft comes from. All quiet now, please. Just round this bend, I think. Oh, yes, an iron gate. It's a little room with a door at the other end. A dungeon, I should think. Let's see if this gate's locked. We're in luck, and the door at the other end is open too. That's where the draught is coming from. Come on, then. Let's see what's behind it. Another passage and some steps. Let me look. Another huge door, but this one's bolted. Oh, no. <laughs> but fortunately, the bolt is on our side. It's been oiled recently, too. Well, well, other people have been here not long ago and used this door. We'd better go quietly, in case they're still here. Be careful, Julian. Somebody may have heard us. They may be waiting to ambush us. They it's all right, Anne. Don't worry. Old Timmy would give us a warning growl if he heard a single footstep. Right. Here goes. Uh, wow! See where we've come to. Did you ever see such a storehouse of wonders? Let us see. 
It's fantastic. And there are the golden statues I saw. Look in this chest, this beautiful carved chest. Gold cups and plates and dishes. And look what's over here. It's a set of animals carved out of some lovely green stone. That's jade. Beautiful. Goodness knows how much they're worth. They should be in some sort of museum, not in here. Why didn't those collectors take these things then? That's obvious. This is a secret cellar, I should think. There's probably a sliding panel or hidden door that leads to it, somewhere in the castle above. And those men we saw are certainly not here to guard the animals on the island as they were in the old couple's day. You think they're in somebody's pay then? Somebody who knows about the treasure chamber and wants it for himself? Yes. And what's more, I don't think the real owner of the island even knows they're here or anyone's taking things from the island. But now the thing is, what are we going to do about it? We'll talk about it when we get back to the cottage. It's getting late. It'll be pitch dark outside unless the moon is up. Well, come on then. Let's go. Someone's coming. Quick, hide behind this chest. Emilio, Emilio, are you in here? Yeah, I'm coming. Oh, there you are. What are you doing behind me? I thought I had you in here. No, not me, Carlo. Well, anyway, you know the boat. It comes tonight to take the next batch of goods. Eh? You got the list? We must wrap them quickly, take them to the shore. This little statue has to go, I know. Eh? Yeah, I'll get the stuff. And I'll lay... Hey, what's this I see? A foot! Hey, Carlo, there's someone here. Right, out of there, you... Hey, kids, now what are you doing here, eh? How you get in? <coughs> hey, hey, keep that dog back or I'll shoot him. Who are you? Now tell us what you're doing here. We came by boat, but the boat got washed out to sea. And we just... Um, wandered into this place by mistake. By mistake? A likely story. Well, I can tell you, you certainly made the biggest mistake of your lives. You'll have to stay here for quite a long time, till our job's done at any rate. Oh, what is your job then? Wouldn't you like to know? Well, part of it is to guard the island and keep off strangers like you. Now, I'm afraid we've got jobs to do, and you're going to have a miserable time. You stay in this old cellar till we come back here again. Hey, are we better go, Carlo? Oh, we missed the boat out there. And we can deal with these kids when we get back. I'll take this statue. Right. And yeah. Don't say anything in case they're listening outside the door. Mm, no, I think they've gone. And suppose they never come back. We'll be here for keeps. No, we won't. We can easily escape. What? Through that locked and bolted door? No, silly. Up there, see? What am I supposed to look at, Anne? The old stone wall? No, up there, to the right of that tall chest. What an idiot I am. That's the old iron door inside the old well wall, isn't it? I see what you're getting at, Anne. Good old Anne. Of course. We've only got to climb up to that hole in the wall, open the door, and go up the well. Yes, but that's easier said than done. We've got to get hold of the rope and climb to the top. Not very easy. Anyway, it's our only hope of escape. Help push that chest until it's underneath the opening. Oh, come on! It was quite a job pushing the heavy chest into position. Then, once they'd managed that, they had to get a little table on the top, so they could reach the little iron door that led into the old well. Julian and Wilfred lifted the table up, and Julian climbed up and gave the little iron door a hard shove. It shook a little, but didn't budge. So Dick climbed up alongside him and pushed, until, with a groan, it gave way and swung open inside the well wall. To the boy's delight, there was the rope hanging near them. Julian climbed up the rope first, followed by Wilfred. Then the two of them wound the rope up with Anne holding on. Dick saw her disappear up the well and heaved a sigh of relief. Now for George. George, where are you? Come on. I'm not going. You know Timmy can't hang on to a rope. I'm staying here with him. You go up the well. Certainly not. 
Right, you kids. Now I'm going to... Go for them, Timmy! I... Get them before they can hurt you! <laughs> Timmy, you've knocked him out. He's hit his head on the chest when Timmy bowled him over. I'll take Timmy down the secret way through the cliff stick, all right? Yes, go on. I'll climb up the well. Julian! What happened? I'll tell you in a minute. Swing the rope a bit towards me. Are you mad at me? I want to keep you. What? Hey, what the... Carlo! Hey, here, you up there! Come here! Not likely, but you can have this table if you want. What? Hey, ow! Julian, pull me up quickly! Pull! In the meantime, George was hurrying down the secret way through the cliffs. Timmy ran first in front, and then behind. His ears pricked up for any possible pursuer or danger. He could hear no one. Good. It wasn't long before he and George came out of the tunnel in the cliff and found themselves on the rocks. The sea was splashing over them and the waves gleamed in the bright moonlight. George saw something moving in the distance and put her hand on Timmy's collar. But he disobeyed her for once and leapt away, splashing through the pools over the seaweed, barking madly. He had caught the scent of the others on the wind. What a joyful meeting that was. They all sat down on a convenient rock and talked 19 to the dozen, telling each other what had happened. And then a big wave suddenly came up and splashed all over them. Blow! Tide's coming in, I suppose. Come on, let's get back to Whispering Wood. I don't know what the time is. All I know is that I'm suddenly very sleepy. It's very late. Long past our bedtime. What should we do? Risk sleeping here on the island, or find Wilfred's boat and row across to the mainland and have a peaceful sleep in that dear little cottage? Oh, don't let's stay on the island. I'd never go to sleep. I'd be afraid those men would find us. Don't be silly, Anne. They wouldn't have the remotest idea where to look for us. I honestly don't fancy looking for Wilfred's boat, rowing all the way to the mainland, and then climbing up that steep hill to the cottage. Well, all right. But oughtn't somebody to be on guard? Shouldn't we each take turns? Why? Timmy would hear anyone, wouldn't he? I suppose so. All right. We'll stay here, then. They were all very tired. The boys pulled armfuls of old dry bracken and spread it on a patch of grass where bushes sheltered them from the wind. In about three seconds, George was fast asleep. Wilfred dropped off at once, too, and Dick and Julian were soon giving gentle little snores. Anne was still awake. She lay and worried, keeping her ears open for any strange sound. Timmy heard her tossing and turning and crept over to her very quietly so as not to wake George. He lay down beside Anne, giving her a loving lick. But still she didn't fall asleep. And then, quite suddenly, she heard something. So did Timmy. He sat up and gave a very small growl. Anne strained her ears. Yes, it was certainly voices she could hear, low voices. It was the men coming to find Wilfred's boat. Timmy ran a little way from the bushes. Anne got up quietly and followed. She really must see what was happening. The men had come quietly round the island in their own boat to set Wilfred's boat adrift. Anne saw them pushing it down the sand towards the sea. Once it was adrift, she and the others would be prisoners on the island. She yelled at the top of her voice. You stop that! It's our boat! Stop that, I say! How dare you come and take our boat! And get them, Timmy, get them! How dare you take our boat! Bite them, Timmy! Call him off! I'm getting out of here! Good, they're going! Anne! Anne, are you all right? What's happening? Oh, Julian, I'm so glad you've come. I think Timmy and I have frightened them off. Those men were going to set our boat loose. Frighten them off? You scared them stiff. Good gracious. 
the mouse has suddenly turned into a fearsome tiger. A tiger? Am I really? I'm glad. Julian, why can't we row back to the mainland now? I've a good mind to take that boat of Wilfred's and row myself back if you don't want to come. <laughs> I believe it's dangerous to say no to a tiger. So you shall have your way, Anne. I'm awfully hungry anyway, and I bet the others are too. I bet if those men spot us out in the sea in a boat going across to the mainland, they'll feel pretty uncomfortable. They'll know we'll be going to the police first thing tomorrow. This has been quite an adventure, hasn't it? I shall be glad of a little peace now. Well, you shall have it, Julia. That little cottage is waiting for you all, with its glorious view over the harbour and whispering island. You'll have quite a lot of excitement tomorrow, of course, when the police take you back to the island in their boat, and you show them the old well, the vast treasure chamber, the secret passage, and all the rest. You'll be there when the men are rounded up, and you'll watch them chugging off prisoners in the police boat, amazed that the famous five should have defeated them. What an adventure! And what a relief now that the excitement is over and the five have seen the last of the police. Now for a real lazy time. Let's all go out on the hill in the sunshine and have orangeade and biscuits and fruit salad. And Wilfred shall play his magic pipe and bring his furred and feathered friends to see us. Has he found his pipe then? Yes. He took the well bucket to get some water to drink, and lo and behold, the pipe was at the bottom of the bucket. He thinks it must have fallen there the last time he went to fetch water from the well. Oh, good. Wilfred, what about playing a tune on your little pipe? I'm so glad it's found. I'd like to hear it again. All right. I'll see if my friend here still remembers me. As Wilfred began to play, the birds in the trees turned their heads, the lizards raised themselves, rabbits stopped their play, and a magpie flew down to the boy's foot and sat there. Wilfred didn't stir. He just went on playing as the creatures came to listen. Julian is lying back, looking at the April sky, glad that their adventure ended so well. Dick is looking down to Whispering Island, set in the brilliant blue harbour. Anne is half asleep. A quiet little Anne, who can turn into a tiger if she has to. And George, of course, is close to Timmy, her arms around his neck. Very happy indeed. Goodbye, famous five. It was fun sharing in your grand adventure. Go Down to the Sea by Enid Blyton The famous five, Julian, Dick, Anne and George, with Timmy George's dog, were on their way to Kirin Station to catch the train bicycles and all. Their luggage had gone on in advance and they thought they had plenty of time to ride to the station, get their bicycles labelled and put in the luggage van, then catch the train comfortably. Suddenly, Dick let out a yell. Blow! I've got a puncher! My tyre's going flat! You've just got time to pump it up and hope for the best. We've got seven minutes before the train goes. OK, Julian. We can't miss the train. We can, George. Easiest thing in the world. What do you say, Timmy? <coughs> Done it. Seems all right. Hope it will last till we get to the station. I was afraid you'd have to go without me. Oh, no. We'd have caught the next train. Come on, let's go, quickly. Right, Anne. Race you! 
there. Look, the signal's gone up. The train's due. Oh, we've made it. Here's the porter. Hello, you lot. I sent your luggage off for you. Can you label our bikes quickly for us? I see the train is due. I will, that. You going off to Cornwall, I see. And to Tamanon, too. You want to be careful of bathing there? There's a fierce coast and a hungry sea. Oh, do you know it? Is it a nice place? Nice? Well, I don't know about that. I used to go out in my uncle's fishing boat all round there, and it's wild and lonely. Not much of a place for holiday. No pier, no concert parties, no cinemas, no nothing. Good. We can do without all those. We mean to bathe, hire a boat and fish and bike all round. That's our kind of holiday. Yes, and yours too, Timmy. Come on, we'd better get into a carriage. I'll see to your bikes. Have a good holiday, and if you see my uncle, tell him you know me. His name's same as mine, John Paul Penny. By tree, pole and pen, you may know the Cornish men. Thanks, John. We'll look up your uncle if we can. They each took a corner seat and settled down for the journey. Anne announced that she was determined they wouldn't have any adventures this time. Just a holiday, nothing more. The others weren't so certain, but they didn't argue. The journey was a long one, but at last the train arrived at their station, Paul Willie Holt. They got off, collected their bikes, and set off along the narrow lane to Tremannan Farm. As they cycled through the open gates at five o'clock, a fusillade of barks greeted them, and four dogs came flying to meet them. Timmy put up his hackles at once and growled warningly. A woman came out behind the dogs. Her face was one large smile. Now, Ben. Now, Bouncer. Here, Nelly, here. Bad dog, Willie. It's all right, children. That's just their way of saying, Welcome to Tremannan Farm. This is Timmy. He's very friendly. And <laughs> look, now they're all wagging their tails. Yes, they've introduced themselves to one another. Now come with me. You must be tired and dirty. I have a high tea waiting for you. Follow me upstairs and I'll show you to your rooms. This is your room, girls. And boys, that's yours. Oh, thank you. This is nice. And such a lovely view. Thank you, Mrs Penruthen. This will suit us fine, won't it, Dick? It certainly will. Good. There's the bathroom if you'd like a wash. Now I'll just pop down and put the kettle on. Come down as soon as you like. We must bike to the sea as soon as we can. There are caves on this coast. We'll explore them. I wonder if Mrs Penruflin would give us picnic lunches so that we could go off for the day whenever we want to. Sure to. She's a pet. I've never felt so welcome in my life. Are we all ready? Come on down then. I'm beginning to feel very empty indeed. The high tea that awaited them was truly magnificent. A huge ham and a salad fit for a king. The children were tucking in when footsteps were heard outside the room. The door opened and the farmer himself came in. The children stared at him in awe. He was a strange and magnificent figure of a man, tall, well over six feet, broadly built and extremely dark. His mane of hair was black and curly. His hands were enormous and covered with hair so thick and black it was like fur. This is Mr. Penruthlin. Hello, sir. Well, Mr. Penruthlin, and how's the cow getting along? Well, you are. Oh, I'm glad she's all right. And is the calf a dear little thing? And what's the colour? You mean are. <laughs> Red and white like its mother. What shall we call it? We may uh, uh, Yes. Well, call it Buttercup, then. 
You always have such good ideas, <laughs> Mr. Penruthlin. <laughs> Who are you? What's this paper then, Mr. Penruthlin? Shall I read it out? <laughs> ah. Now here's a bit of excitement. The Barneys will be along this week. You'll love them. What are the Barneys? They're travelling players that wander round the countryside and play an act in our big barns. Oh, you call them Barneys because they use your barns for their shows. Yes, we shall love to see them. Will they play in your barn? Yes. We'll have all the village here when the Barneys come. Now there's a treat for you. You are. You treat. He says you'll like Clopper the horse. The things he does. The way he sits down and crosses his legs. <laughs> well, you wait and see. <laughs> that horse. <laughs> After their wonderful high tea, the four children didn't feel like doing very much. Dick thought he ought to mend his puncture, and Julian went outside with him. Mrs. Penruthlin began to stack the dishes and clear away. George and Anne offered to help her. Well, that's kind of you, Anne and Georgina, but you're tired tonight. You can give me a hand some other time. By the way, which of you is which? Oh, I'm Anne, and I'm George, not Georgina, so please don't call me that. I always wanted to be a boy, so I only like to be called George. She won't answer unless you do call her George. Well, we'll go out with the boys. That's that. Punch amended. Good. There comes Mr. Penruthlin. Just look at that huge load of straw he's carrying. Why doesn't he talk properly? Mrs. P seems to understand him. She said she had seven children. I suppose they're all as talkative as her, and he never got a chance to get a word in. Ah, here come the girls, with a little urchin following them. Who's this you've brought with you? I don't know. He suddenly appeared behind us and won't go away. Hey, you! Who are you? What's your name? Jan. Jan. That's a funny name. It probably means Jan. All right, Jan. You can go now. I want to stay. Well, you can't. We don't want to be followed everywhere. Go away. Run off. Vamoose. Bunk. Scoot. Is Jan bothering you? He's as full of curiosity as a cat. Go home, Jan. Take this packet of food to your old granddad, and here's some for you. He's shot off like a rabbit. Who is he? He's a poor little thing. He's got no kith or kin except for his old great granddad, and there's more than eighty years between them. The old man is our shepherd. He's got a hut on the other side of that hill, and the boy lives with him. Does he go to school? No, he plays truant nearly all the time. You ought to go and talk to his old great granddad. His father was one of the wreckers on this coast, and he can tell you some strange stories about those dreadful days. I'd forgotten that this Cornish coast was the haunt of the wreckers. They shone false lights to bring ships closer into shore, so that they would be smashed to pieces on the rocks, didn't they? Yes, and then they robbed the poor groaning ship when she was helpless, and it said they paid no heed to drowning folk either. Those were wicked days. The first three days at Tremannan Farm were lazy, uneventful. Full of sunshine, good food, dogs, and of little Yan. He really was a perfect nuisance. The four children seemed to have a fascination for him, and he trailed them everywhere. What's the use of telling him to go? He disappears behind one hedge and appears out of another. What I can't understand is why Timmy puts up with him. Well, I'm going to find his great granddad tomorrow and tell him to keep Yan with him. Oh no! There he is again. Timmy is certainly pleased to see him. Timmy, come here. You ought to chase Jan away, not encourage him. He can't be a bad kid though, because Timmy likes him so much. Timmy never likes anyone horrid. Well, he's made a mistake this time. Let's go down to the sea and bathe. We'll go on our bikes, and then Jan won't be able to pop up and watch us.
They took their bicycles and rode off to the coast with a picnic Mrs. Penruthland made for them. The narrow lane wound down between two high rocky cliffs to the sea, and in front of them was a cove into which raced enormous breakers. After leaving their bikes at the top of the cove and changing into their bathing things, they walked a little way round the cliffs and came to a great pool lying in a rock hollow. The four of them swam to their heart's content. They picnicked on the rocks and then went to explore round the foot of the cliffs. I suppose when the tide's in, all these coves are shoulder high in water. Yes. No wonder Mrs. Penruthland warned us about the tides here. I wouldn't want to try and climb up these cliffs if we were caught. Well, I'm blessed. Look, peeping from behind that rock. The wretched Yan. He must have run all the way here and found us. Well, we'll leave him here. It's time we went. Do you think he knows about the tide? It's coming in and might catch him. Of course he knows. But we'll wait and have our tea at the top part of the cove if you like. That's the only way back if he wants to escape the tide. By the time they had finished eating, Yan had not appeared. Dick and Julian went down to the cove, but there was no sign of him. The children cycled back to the farm and told Mrs. Penruthlin of their concern. She laughed and told them not to worry. Yan knew how to look after himself. Greatly relieved, George suddenly spoke. Look, do you see what I see? It's Yan. Yan, have a barley sugar. Thanks. How did you get away from the beach this afternoon? I came the wreckers' way. My granddad showed me. You should come and see my granddad. He'll tell you many things. The wreckers' way? Yes. We'll visit him tomorrow afternoon. I'll go and tell him. He doesn't seem such a bad kid after all. The secret of the wrecker's way sounds interesting. <laughs> it might even lead to an adventure. Cheer up, Anne. I can't even smell an adventure in Tremannan. I think you're wrong. I can smell one. I don't want to, but I can. The next day was Sunday, and after lunch, Jan arrived to take the children to see his great granddad. Mrs. Penruthland packed a big basket of food for them to take and Yan proudly led the way on the long walk over the fields to the cone-shaped hill. The old shepherd was sitting outside his hut, smoking a clay pipe. He had Yan's sudden smile, and the children liked him immediately. You're welcome. Yan told me about you. We've brought our tea to share with you. Is it true your father was one of the wreckers in the old days? <laughs> Aye, it is. You seen the rocks down on Tremannan coast? Oh, wicked rocks they are, hungry for ships and men. Many a ship has been wrecked on purpose. How did they get wrecked on purpose? Oh, way back up the coast, more than a hundred years ago, there was a light set up to guide the ships that sail round here. They were to sail towards that light and then hug the coast and avoid the rocks that stood out to sea. They were safe then. But on wild nights, a light was set up two miles further down the coast to bemuse the lost ships and drag them onto the rocks round Tremannan coves. How wicked! How could men do that? Oh, it's amazing what men will do. Take my old dad now, a kind man he was, and went to church. But he was the one that set the false light burning every time and sent men to watch the ship crashing over the rocks and breaking into pieces. Did you ever see a ship crashing to its death? Aye, I did. I was sent to the cove with the men and had to hold a lantern when the ship came on the rocks and next day to help collect the goods that was scattered round the cove. There were lots drowned that night. And... Where did they flash the light from? I'll show you where my dad flashed it from. It's not far. Come on, follow me. Right. Now, there's only one place on these hills where you could see the light flashing. 
The wreckers had to find somewhere well hidden so that their wicked light could be seen from inland. Or the police would have seen it, I suppose, and put a stop to it. That's right. <laughs> now, here we are. Yeah. Now, look, between those two hills, see that house? Yes, I can. And the tower rising up from it. Yes. That's where the light was set. You only have to move a few steps left or right, and you can't see it. Uh, I was the only one who ever knew the false light could be seen from inland. Did you often see the light flashing over there when you watched the sheep? Oh, yes, yes, many a time. And always on wild, stormy nights, when ships were looking for some light to guide them into shore. Then a light would flare out over there, and I'd say to myself... Now may the good God help those sailors tonight, for it's sure nobody else will. How horrible! You must be glad that you never see that false light shining there on stormy nights now. Young man, that light still flares on dark and stormy nights. The place is a ruin, but three times this year I've seen that light. Come another stormy night, it'll flare again. I know it in my bones. But surely there are no wrecks on this coast now? No, there has not been a wreck along this coast for more years than I can remember. But I tell you, that light flares up just as it used to. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen it too. You hold your tongue. You've never seen the light. I've seen it. Grandad, do you know anything about Wrecker's Way? Is it a secret way down to the coast from inland? That's a secret. <laughs> My dad showed it to me, and I swore I would never tell. But Jan said you taught him the way. Jan? That boy? He doesn't know anything about Wrecker's Way. I'm the last one left who knows of it. Jan? He's dreaming. Oh. Who could possibly flash that light? Are you sure it wasn't lightning you saw on a dark and stormy night? It wasn't lightning. I first saw that light near 90 years ago, and I tell you, I saw it again three times this year. Same place, same light, same weather. And if you told me it wasn't flashed by mortal hands, I'd believe you. There was silence after this extraordinary statement. They all went back to the hut and shared the food. Then the children thanked the old shepherd for a most interesting afternoon, and said goodbye. As they walked slowly back to the farm, they chatted about the stories the old man had told them. Well, what do you think he meant when he talked about the light still flashing in the tower? Was it true, do you suppose? There's only one way to find out. Wait for a stormy night and go and see. But what about our agreement? No adventures. <sighs> we ought to keep to the agreement, but I know no one else thinks so. Hey, look! All those horses and old-fashioned carts coming along the road. Who are these people? They're dressed pretty old-fashioned, too. It's the Barneys! The strolling players. See, it's painted on the side of the biggest cart. You're right, Anne. This'll be fun. Hello! Will you be playing at Tremannan Farm? Uh, to be sure, we always play there. Are you staying there? Yes, we'll look out for you. Good. They look a merry lot. All but the man driving the front cart. He looked pretty grim, I thought. He was probably the owner of the Barneys and has got all the worries on his shoulders. As the children walked into the farmyard, Mr Penruthland came by. He grunted at them and went into a barn. Anne whispered that she could imagine the farmer being a wrecker, and Dick agreed. Mr. Penruthland looked so fierce and determined, almost ruthless. The shepherd's story about the light intrigued them all. They couldn't make up their minds whether it was true or not, but decided there was only one way to find out. They would go and explore the ruined tower. The sun suddenly went in. Black clouds appeared. There was a storm coming. The storm arrived about an hour later. The thunder crashed and rumbled and lightning flashed. Then down came the rain. How it poured. Julian, is it possible?
careful to go and see if the light flashes tonight. Of course not. We'd be drenched. All right. Anyway, I don't feel quite such an urge to go now that it's so pitch dark. Just as well. Come on, Dick. The Penruthlins won't go to bed till we do. Let's all turn in. Right. Good night, Mrs. Penruthlin. Mr. Penruthlin. Good night, children. Mr. Penruthlin may have to get up in the night to see to Jenny the horse, just in case you hear a noise. Okay. Good night. Good night, you two. Good night. Sleep well. It's really hot and sticky in this storm. Yes. Thank goodness it seems to be passing over. Dick, it's stopped raining. Let's go and see if that light is flashing tonight. Right. It would be great to get some fresh air anyway. Got your torch? Yes. Come on then, quiet as we can. I'll use my torch. Shh! You'll wake the dogs. Let's go out by the back door. This way. Ah, a nice cool breeze. Now, do we go through the farmyard? That's the shortest way to the stile, I think. That's Jenny, the horse that's not well. Let's have a look at her and see if she's all right. She looks fine to me, munching away. That's good. Let's go on. Julian, did you hear that? No, what? It sounded like a cough. Probably a sheep. No, it wasn't a sheep. You imagined it. Julian, there's somebody a good way in front of us. The flash of lightning lit him up. He was climbing over the stile to the lane we're making for. Well, if we saw him, he's quite likely to have seen us. Not unless he was looking backwards. Come on, let's see where he's going. Here's the stile. I'll go first. <laughs> Ouch! Let go of me! Take that! <laughs> This head will do. Thank goodness he didn't spot me. Dick! Dick! Julian, I'm here. Are you all right? He's gone up the lane. He nearly wrenched my shoulder off. I gave him a good kick. Who was it? Did you see? No, I didn't. I dropped my torch by the stile when he grabbed me. Let's go and find it. It should be somewhere here. We'll have to feel around for it. I daren't switch my torch on. I've got it. <coughs> There's that cough again. Quick, hide. We'll follow this chap to see where he goes. Yes, good idea. The man came up to the stile and climbed over. Cautiously, the boys followed him across the fields. To their surprise, he went to the farm across the yard and in through the front door of the house. It was Mr. Penruthlin. The boys went quietly in by the back door, crept up to their room and heaved great sighs of relief as they shut the door behind them. The two boys looked curiously at Mr. Penruthlin the next morning. It seemed strange to think of their adventure with him the night before. And he didn't even know it was them he was trying to catch. The farmer finished his cup of tea and went out. Mrs. Penruthlin told them he'd had a bad night and had spent two hours sitting up with Jenny, the sick horse. Julian and Dick looked at each other, but said nothing. After breakfast, the four children went out to pick plums and berries for a fruit salad, and the boys told the girls about the night before. us you were going. I always thought Mr. Penruthlin looks sort of sinister. I'm sure he's up to no good. Hmm, it's a pity. His wife is so nice. Oh, there's Jan. I saw the light last night. You don't mean the light that flashes in the old tower? Yes, a big light, like a fire. Did your granddad see it? Yes. What time was this? Don't know. Can't tell the time. 
blow. We missed it. Well, we'll go tonight and watch for it. I'll come too. No, you won't. Oh no! It's starting to rain. Come on, let's go in. Here's the fruit, Mrs. Penruthlin. Thank you, dears. I've just heard the barn is one hour barn for tomorrow night. Would you like to help get the barn ready? You bet. They're on their way over now. Come on, we'll go and meet them. Thank goodness the barn's so close. At least it's dry in here. Here are the barnies now. Well, hello, children. Are you come to help us? Yes. What's that you're carrying? Oh, is that clop of the horse's head? That's right. When I'm in charge of it, never let it out of my sight. It's the governor's orders. Who's the governor? The grim-looking man over there. That's him. Well, what do you think of my horse? It's beautifully made. Ah, it can open and shut its mouth and its eyes. Do you see that? It's wonderful. I'm only the hind legs, but I work the tail too. Mister Binks over there, he's the front legs. Oh, by the way, my name's Sid. What's yours? I'm Julian, and this is Dick. Can we see you and Mister Binks practicing? Oh, I think we can manage that. Here, Binks, better practice for Clapper wanted. You get the legs. <laughs> Binks and Sid clothed themselves in the horse's canvas skin and legs, and somebody came and zipped up the two halves. Clapper looked a lively, comical beast. It marched left, right, left, right. It did a little tap dance with its front feet, which then remained perfectly still while the back feet did the same little tap dance. The children and the whole company watched, and even the grim-faced governor had to smile. It was a mad, happy morning, for the Barneys were full of jokes and laughter. The children felt quite sorry when Mrs. Penruthlin called them into lunch. By the end of the day, the big barn was quite transformed. A stage had been set up, and a backcloth painted with a country scene had been hung over the wooden wall at the back of the stage. They had a late high tea that evening, and a little while after it was finished and cleared up, Mrs. Penruthlin suggested they all had an early night. When the two boys went up to their room, Julian looked out of the window. It's certainly stormy out there—a good night for wreckers, if there were any nowadays. When shall we go and look for the light, Julian? We can go now, I think. It's dark enough and getting late. Come on. Right. Quietly does it. We'll go out of the back door again. Walking into this wind is hard work. At least it'll blow us home when we come back. Here's the style. No, Mr. Penruthlin tonight. Thank goodness. Now the hut's in that direction. I can hear the odd sheep baring. We must be getting close. Yes, there's the hut. You can just see its dark outline. We must go quietly now. There's no light in it. Grandad and Yan must be fast asleep. Now we've got to find exactly the right spot to see the tower. What do you think? Is this the right line? Hmm, I'm not quite sure. I think we should go over that way. Dick, who's that? I saw someone there. Who is it? It's me, Jan. Good gracious! You turn up everywhere. I suppose you're watching out for us. Yes. Come with me. Hey, not quite so fast. There's the light. I see it. It seems to be some kind of signal. Flash, 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 flash. How weird. Who's doing it and why? Surely there are no records nowadays. My granddad says it's his old dad. That's silly. All the same, it's a bit of a mystery. Well, we shall hear tomorrow if there's been a wreck. But surely there aren't any wreckers here now. If there are, they'll be creeping down the wreckers' way wherever it is, and watching for the ship to crash to pieces. 
Then they'll collect the booty. Shut up, Julian. Don't talk like that. Now what are we going to do about that light? We're going to find that tower and see what's going on. As soon as ever we can, too. Maybe tomorrow. I'm glad you found us, Yan. Thanks for your help. When we go to explore the old tower, would you like to show us the way to it? No. I'm frightened of that tower now. All right, Yan. You needn't come. It is pretty peculiar. I must admit. Now off you go. Back to your hut. Yan shot off in the dark like a scared rabbit. The boys made their way home, not very cautiously, for they felt sure they were the only people out that night. But when they came to the farmyard, they saw something that made them stop suddenly. There's a light in the big barn. It's somebody with a torch, flashing it on and off. Who is it? One of the Barneys, perhaps. They're sleeping in the sheds nearby. Let's go and see. Here we are. The door's open a crack. Look at that, where the clothes are hanging up. Somebody's going through the pockets. A thief. Blow. He switched the torch off. Did you see who it was? No. Just a sec. Yes, he switched the torch on again. He's going through the drawers in that chest. Look, that hand covered in black hairs. Mr. Penruflem, what's he doing? He must be mad, walking about at night on the hills, stealing into the barn, going through pockets, looking in drawers of that chest. He's weird. Come on, I really don't want to spot him taking something. It would be so awkward if we had to say we saw him stealing. door's still unlocked. Let's wake the girls and tell them. I can't wait till the morning. Right. Hey, Anne, George, we've got some news. Come in. What's up? We saw the light flashing from the old tower. So it was true what old Grandad said then. Julian, you don't think we'll hear of a wreck tomorrow, do you? I couldn't bear it. Nor could I. We saw something else too. Mr. Penruflin was in the big barn going through the pockets of the Barney's clothes. What? Surely not. Whatever for? No idea. Anyway, we must explore that tower as soon as possible. We can't go tomorrow. The Barneys will be here, and we've promised to help Mrs. Penruthren. It'll have to be the next day, then. See you in the morning. Good night. The boys stole back to their room and were soon fast asleep tired out with their long walk over the hills. Next day was so busy that it was quite difficult to find time to remember the night's happenings. They were reminded of it by one thing, though. Mrs. Penruthlin said how well she had slept. Mr. Penruthlin, too. He told her he never moved all night. The five spent a very busy day helping to get things ready. Their last task was to help Mrs. Penruthlin carry masses of delicious food to the table for the supper after the show. The show was a great success, although it could not have been simpler. As for Clopper, it was his evening. Julian and Dick watched him fascinated. Just look at Clopper marching up and down to the music. Sid and Binks are very good, aren't they? Gosh, I wish we could get hold of the legs and head and do the act at the Christmas school concert. Let's ask Sid if we can have a shot sometime. He won't lend us the head. Still, we could just try the legs. That's the end of the show. I really enjoyed it. Me too. Come on, let's go and have supper. All the Barneys will be there. We can ask Sid then.
There's Sid. Hello, Sid. Where's the governor? The governor? Oh, he's sitting in solitary state in the barn. He'll be having a tray of food all on his own. Where's Clopper? The horse's head, I mean. Is it under the table? Oh, no, the governor's got it tonight. Said he wasn't going to have the jelly or the gravy dropped all over it. Look, Julian, Mrs. Penruthland's getting a tray ready. Mrs. Penruthland, is that for the governor? Shall I take it for you? Oh, thank you, Julian. And Dick can take a bottle and glass for him. Right. Come on, Dick. Funny. There's no one in the barn. Look, there's a note pinned on the curtain. Back in an hour, gone for a walk. The governor. We'll just leave the tray then. Oh, look, Dick. Clopper's front and back legs. Shall we? Have a go. Yes. Come on. You be the back legs and I'll be the front ones. Quick. Right, I've got my legs on. Let me get behind you, and we'll do the zip up. There. Pity we can't find the head. I saw something large hidden under a shawl on a chair before I zipped up in here. Let's go and look. Ready? Keep in step. You're right, Dick, it is the head. I'll just feel inside to see how the eyes and mouth work. Mm, there's a sort of lid inside the neck. Oh, blow. Cigarettes all over the place. Mr Binks must hide them in the secret compartment. Bend your knees so that I can pick them up. <laughs> Do hurry up! Right, I've got the head on. There are eye holes in the neck. That's how Binks sees where he's going. Now, I'll count one, two, one, two, and we'll walk in time. I say, what's that noise? Someone's coming in. It's the governor coming back. Quick, gallop out of the door before we're caught. What the... Oi! I can't see where I'm going. Oh, thank goodness, it's an empty stable. Quick, let's unzip ourselves, and you'll have to take this head off for me. I can't move the zip. You have a try. Oh no, it's stuck. Now what do we do? We'll have to get help. Let's go and scout round the kitchen. I'll try and look through the window. Oh, blow it. I've banged the head on the window. Ah, a horse? Mr Penruthland, one of the horses is loose. It looked through the window. The farmer went out at once. Desperately, the horse tried to gallop away, but the back legs and front legs didn't gallop together, got entangled, and down went the horse. The farmer ran up in alarm, thinking his horse had fallen. When he reached it, he was astounded to hear human voices coming from it. Then he realised what was happening. It was the stage horse with two people in it, who sounded like Julian and Dick. The farmer let out a terrific guffaw, bent down and undid the zip. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, thanks, Mr. Penruthland. We, we, we were just having a canter around. Oh, did you canter around? I suppose he meant he was going back to his supper. Come on, Dick. Let's put the horse back in the big barn. Quiet as we can. the governor walking up and down wait a sec right he's at the far end now shove it in <laughs> good that's it he didn't hear us now back to the kitchen and some supper julian dick what have you been doing don't you want anything to eat yes we do want something to eat i'm starving <laughs> <laughs> What's that, Mr. Penruthlin? Oh, they've been helping you catch the horse that peeped in at the window, have they? Which horse was it? We should go... Clobber! 
It had been a wonderful evening. The children helped to clear away the dishes, then they all went to bed and were soon asleep. Next day was fair and warm. Mrs. Penruthland suggested that she make them up a picnic and that they should go off for the day. Nothing could be better. Julian had already planned to make his way to the old tower, once used by the wreckers. They set off together happily, with Timmy at their heels. They'd gone quite a long way when George groaned. Look, Julian, there's Jan coming. Hello, Jan. Buzz off today. We're going somewhere alone. I'm coming too. No, you don't come too. Can't we come too, Anne? No, not today. Take this sweet, Jan, and go away. Oh! Let me have another look at the map before we go on. Look, there are two hills side by side. I believe they are the hills between which we saw the tower. Yes, you're right. We're nearly there. This seems to be the start of a lane. Very overgrown. Let's try it. Here's the end. Look, the tower. It's in ruins. And the house too. Come on in. There's a stone stairway going up to the tower. And look here. What's this on each stair? Oil. Somebody's been carrying oil up in a can or lamp and has spilt it. We'd better be careful. That somebody may still be here. Let's go up. I'll go first. The tower was built at one end of the old house. The only entry to it was by a doorway inside the house. In the tower was a stone spiral stairway. When the children reached the top, they gasped. The view over the sea was astonishing. Near the coast, the breaking waves and spray showed the hidden rocks that waited for unwary ships. You can see what a wonderful place this is for flashing a light over the sea, a light that guided them straight onto those great rocks. Are those the rocks near the coves we went to the other day? Yes, I think so. The ships must have been wrecked on the rocks down there. But how did the wreckers get there? The wreckers way, do you think? Well, I don't know. I imagine that Wreckers Way must have led to the sea from inland somewhere, a way for villagers to use. The people who lived here flashed their false light to a ship, and when it crashed onto the rocks, they gave a signal to the watcher on the hills. How horrible! Old Grandad's father probably lived in this very house and lit the lamp on stormy nights. Well, somebody else lights it now. Somebody who can't be up to any good either. Look, there's an oily patch on this wall facing the sea and another on this side facing the hill I wonder who it could be could it be Mr. Penruthland do you suppose no he's the watcher on the hills that's why he goes out on wild nights to see if there's a signal from the tower what's the point of it if there are no wrecks now smuggling probably by motorboat they choose a stormy night when they're neither seen nor heard wait for the signalling light to show them all's clear, and then come into one of the coves. Yes, and I bet the wrecker's secret way is used by someone who steals down to the cove and takes the smuggled goods. It's ingenious. But what puzzles me is how does the man with the lamp get here? We didn't see any trodden down weeds. There must be some other way into this old house. Of course there is. He must come up some passage from the cove. But where is it? Well, it's not in the tower. Let's go down. Right, you first. Oh, Anne, why have you stopped? I heard a noise down there. What sort of noise did you hear? A sort of scuffling noise. Let's wait a moment and listen hard. Hmm, no sound to be heard now. It must have been a rabbit. Perhaps it was. Well, what should we do now? I'll go down with Timmy. Here goes. Julian paused on the last step of the spiral staircase and listened. Not a sound came from the nearby room. He called out sharply. Anyone there? Still not a sound. 
Julian stepped right into the room and looked round. Nobody was there. The old house only had four rooms, and Julian and Timmy searched them all. Every one of them was empty. Well, Timmy, it's a false alarm. Dig, bring the girls down. There doesn't seem to be anyone here. Coming! I'm sorry I gave you all a shock, but it did sound like somebody down here. However, Timmy didn't seem at all disturbed. What do we do next? Let's see if we can find the entrance to the secret passage. We'll take one room each. Nothing in here. I can't see anything like a door. I can't find a thing. Come back. I've got an idea. We'll make Timmy find the entrance. How? We'll make him smell the oil drips on the steps and follow with his nose any others that have dripped down here. The lamp must have dripped from the passage entrance to the top of the tower. All right. Here, Timmy. Sniff it and follow. <coughs> Look, he's going towards that big room. <coughs> Good old Timmy. Where now? He's stopped by the hearth. He says the trail ends here. So the entrance to the secret passage must be in this big fireplace. Let me have a look in there with my torch. Hello. What's this? I believe we found it. There's a smallish hole on one side, big enough to crawl through. We shall get absolutely filthy. Who cares? This could be very important. Rather, if we're on to what we think we are, smuggling with a big S, it is important. Come on. What about letting Timmy go first? Good idea. Here, boy, in you go. I'll go next. The rest of you follow. We're all in, Julian. Move on. Right. <laughs> Stop, everyone. There's a hole here, like a well. It's got iron hand grips on one side. I'll go down. It's quite easy, like going down a ladder. I'm at the bottom, and I've found the passage. Come on down. We're coming! Uh, 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 Watch yourself, George. Oh, you stepped on my hand! Oh, sorry. This is hard. Oh. Where's Timmy? He must have fallen down and hurt himself. We'll soon come across him, I expect. This way. It's getting wider. Look, we're in a cave. I wish we could find Timmy. We will. Listen, I can hear Timmy. This way. Timmy, here, Timmy. Look, a door. And a jolly stout one too. Tim is behind it. He must have gone in and it's shut behind him. Timmy, we're here. I'll open the door. Uh, 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 Timmy! <coughs> Come and look in here, everyone. It's a storeroom. Look at all those crates and things. The door! can't open it. Somebody's locked it. Hey, let us out! <coughs> let, let us out. out! You came at an awkward time, that's all. And you must remain where you are until tomorrow. Who are you? How dare you lock us in like this? You must pay the penalty for being inquisitive. <laughs> let us out! Uh, no use. He's gone. He must have been watching us from somewhere probably followed us all the way to the old house. It must have been him you heard, Anne. Well, what do we do now? What can we do? I've no doubt that Mrs. Penrufflin will raise the alarm and a search party will set out to find us. Hmm, what a hope they'll have. They won't know the entrance to the secret passage. Oh, dear. Well, let's have some food. They had a very good meal. Then they examined the boxes and crates. 
Some were very old. All were empty. They couldn't find anything of real interest. Julian examined the cave from top to bottom to see if there was any possible way of escape. But there wasn't. To pass the time, they spent several hours playing noughts and crosses and word games till they were sick to death of them. Later on, they had some supper, then started talking about their predicament. That man said we'd come at an awkward time. Why? Are they expecting some smuggled goods tonight? Oh, if only we weren't locked in this cave. We might have spied on them and seen what they were up to and got word to the police. Well, we can't now. If Mr Penruthlin is mixed up in this affair, he'll not be best pleased to be told to fetch the police to look for us. It's just the one night he won't want the police about. I think you're wrong. I think he'd be delighted to have the police looking for lost children and not poking their noses into his affairs. I hadn't thought of that. It's nearly eleven o'clock. I vote we try and go to sleep. Good idea. Where's Timmy? He's gone over to the door. What is it, Timmy? Julian? I believe someone is at the door. Be quiet for a moment and listen. There. Do you hear that scrabbling outside the door? Who's there? I can hear you. Who is it? It's me, Jan. Jan! Gosh, is it really you? Yes. Be quiet, Timmy. Jan, have you got a light? No, it's dark in here. Can I come to you? Yes, of course. Listen, Jan, do you know how to unlock and unbolt a door? Yes. Are you locked in? Yes, but the key may be in the lock. Feel and see. Feel for bolts, too. Slide them back and turn the key. We found one bolt and another one. They're open. I can feel the key, but it's so stiff I can't turn it. Jan, listen to me. Take the key out of the lock and slide it under the door. Do you hear me? Yes, I heard. Well done, Jan. I've got it. Now... Here goes. Oh, oh, yes! Goodness. Let's get out of here. Quick! That man may be back at any minute. Hang on a second. I'll bolt and lock the door and take the key with us. Now, if he comes back, he won't even know we're gone. Where should we go now? It would be madness to go back up the passage to the old house. There's sure to be some signalling going on, and we should be caught again. That passage there goes down to the beat. I went down it when I was looking for you. There's nobody on the beat. Let's go down there, then. Once we feel we're out of danger, we can plan what's best to do. They went down the passage, and at last came out into the open air. The stars were shining in the sky, and gave a fair light after the darkness of the passage. Julian took a quick look at the cliff behind them. It was very steep. They certainly couldn't climb it in the dark. They were discussing what to do when Jan spoke up. I'll take you back by the wrecker's way. Of course. You said you knew the wrecker's way. Lead on, Jan. You're a marvel. We go up this path first. It's not far. It's pretty steep. We've got to squeeze past this big rock. We'll follow you. <laughs> now we are in the wrecker's way. Nobody could have ever guessed there was a way into the cliffs behind that rock. <laughs> Somebody's coming. Go out past the rock again. There's a little cave we can hide in. Here it is. Quiet, everyone. Here they come. Two of them. Sure, that's Mr. Penruthlin. See how enormous he is. Look out to sea. Boat coming. No lights. He'll be on the rocks. Look. The biggest of the men has got into a rowing boat. 
He's rowing out to the motorboat to get the smuggled goods, I bet. They watched as the rowing boat disappeared in the darkness beyond the rocks, then saw the second man going down to the beach. This gave them the perfect chance to escape. They went to the great rock and squeezed behind it into Wrecker's way. Then, Yan leading, they went up the secret passage. They went on and on. The passage was fairly straight and had probably been the bed of an underground stream at some time. Mm. We've walked at least a mile. Shall we be back soon, Yan? Yes. Where does the Wrecker's Way come out? In a shed at Tremannum Farm. Goodness! So it's very nice and handy for Mr. Penruthlan. Impossible for anyone to find out. Except us. There's not much we don't know about Mr. Penruthlan. We're there, Tremannum Farm. Look above your heads. A trapdoor. And it's open. Someone came down here tonight. And we know who. Mr. Penruthlan and his friend. Where does the trapdoor lead to, Yan? Into a corner of the machine shed. When the trapdoor is shut, it's covered with sacks of corn. Right. Let's go up the ladder, everyone. Oh, uh, oh Dick! Uh, careful, George. I'm sorry. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll shut the trapdoor and pile sacks and boxes on top of it. Then, when the men come up, they'll find themselves trapped. If we can get the police in time, they'll be able to catch them easily. Good idea! They shut the big trap door and piled sacks and crates on top. Now nobody could open it from underneath. As they left the shed and made their way to the farmhouse, a sharp whisper, Here! I'm here! made them stop suddenly. Julian couldn't see who it was in the dark, and he quickly flashed his torch on the man. It was the governor, grim-faced as ever. He flinched as the light fell on his face, stepped back and disappeared round a corner. As they trooped in through the kitchen door, Mrs. Penruthlan leapt up from her chair and ran to them. Oh, where have you been? The men in the barn is out looking for you, and Mr. Penruthlan's not home either. We're all safe. We're sorry you've been upset. But where have you been? And where is Mr. Penruthlan? Well, we think there's some smuggling going on around here. We went to explore the old tower and found a secret passage. When we were in the passage, we came across a hidden room, and somebody locked us in it. How did you get out? Jan let us out. Jan? We went on down the passage and came to a cove. Well, I don't know how to say this, but... We saw Mr. Penruthlan in the cove. You saw him in the cove? What was he doing? We, um, we think that he must be one of the smugglers. You wicked boy! Saying things like that about Mr. Penruthlan, who's the straightest, honestest, most God-fearing man who ever lived. I'm very sorry to have made you so angry. I should think I am angry. That wasn't him in Wrecker's Cove. I know it wasn't. I only wish I knew where he was. He's down Wrecker's Way. We put the trapdoor down over him. Down Wrecker's Way? Yes. We came up that way from the beach. It comes up in a corner of the machine shed. We shut the trapdoor and piled things on it. Mr. Penruthlan can't get out. I don't believe it. It's a bad dream. I know who that is. Mr. Penruthlan, you've come walking in. I said you would. What are these children up for? Julian, he's talking normally. Oh, Mr. Penruthlan, these children said you were a smuggler. They said they'd seen you in Wrecker's Cove, and they... What's all this? Well, we've... Uh, we've been exploring that tower and finding out a bit about smugglers, and we really thought we recognised you in Wrecker's Cove, and we thought we trapped you and your friend by shutting the trapdoor. Now, this is important. Forget all this about thinking I'm a smuggler. I'm working with the police... What's this about the trapdoor? Did you really trap those men? Yes, sir. If you want to catch those fellows, send for the police and we'll do it. We've only got to wait beside the trapdoor till the smugglers come. Right. Come along, you two boys. Hurry. Julian and Dick followed Mr. Penruthlan to the machine shed and looked at the trapdoor. 
It was open. The sacks and boxes the children had dragged over it were scattered to one side. Mr. Penruthlin made a very angry noise and flung the trapdoor shut. Silently, he led the way back to the farmhouse. Totally exhausted, everyone went to bed. The two boys flopped on their beds and were asleep in half a second. They didn't even stir when the Barney's wagons came trundling in the yard to be packed with their things. Julian awoke at last. He lay and thought for a while. If only they knew who had opened that trap door. Who could it be? And then something clicked in his mind, and he knew. Of course! The governor standing in the shadows and his whispered message, Here, I'm here! Julian leapt off the bed, shook Dick, and they both rushed downstairs to find Mr. Penruthlin, who was standing watching the Barneys getting ready to go. I've remembered something important to tell you. What is it? I think the man we want is the governor. Whatever makes you think that? The Barneys often come to play here, and nothing could be easier for the governor to arrange for the smuggling to take place then. The wrecker's way entrance is in a shed near the big barn. But why the governor? Last night when we were coming back, he was waiting in the dark, for the smugglers, I'm sure. He must have heard us and thought we were the men. When they didn't come, he must have gone to the trapdoor, found it shut and opened it, waited till the men came and handed him the goods. Now he's got them hidden somewhere in those wagons. So oh, why didn't you tell me last night? We may be too late now. I'll have to get the police to search those wagons. But if I try to stop the Barneys going now, the governor will suspect something and go off at once. Do you know what they're smuggling? Yes. Dangerous drugs. The parcel wouldn't need to be very big. If it's a small parcel, it could be easily hidden. The governor wouldn't have it on him, would he? No, no. He would be afraid of being searched. Oh, hello, boys. You let us a fine dance last night. Clopper was right worried about you. Gosh, you didn't carry Clopper's head all over the hills last night, did you? No, I left it with the governor. Did you? I'll take it. Hey! Bring the horse's head back at once! Now, what's got into him? Why does he want to rush off with Clopper's head for? Mr Penruthen, why does the governor always have someone in charge of Clopper's head? Maybe he hides something precious in there. Quick, let's go and see. At that moment, Dick appeared again, still holding Clopper's head, with Sid and the governor hard on his heels. He panted up to Mr Penruthlin and thrust the head in his hands. The governor raced up and tried to snatch Clopper away from the farmer. You leave that horse alone. It's my property. Isn't it well? Let me just have a feel inside. Ah, what's this? A little secret place with a false bottom. How do I get it open, governor? Now, will you tell me or do I smash Clopper up to find it? No, 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 don't, don't smash him. What's up, governor? We never knew there was a secret about Clopper. There isn't. Ah, I found a trick. Well, what have we here? What's in this neat white packet, eh, governor? Is it one of the many packets of drugs you've handled round this coast? Was it because of this secret of yours you told Sid never to let Clopper out of his sight? Governor, you made me guard your horrible drugs, not Clopper. To think I've been helping you all this time, helping a man who's only fit for prison. Lock the governor up in a small barn. Dan, you get the police. As for you, Barneys, you've lost your governor. But it's good riddance, I'll tell you that. Mr. Banks and I aren't going to use Clopper anymore. He'll bring us bad luck. Eh. Hey. Oh, we'll get a donkey instead and work up a new act. Right, I'll take charge of old Clopper. Right, well, well we'll be off now then. Thanks for everything, Mr. Penruthlin. So long! See you again when you're next by here. You can have my barn any time, Sid. Bye. Bye! Bye! Well, that's all finished up. Dick, I thought you'd gone mad when you went off with old Clopper's head. <laughs> it was a bit of a brainwave. Came over me all of a sudden. Come in! I'm getting breakfast! Sit 
down, all of you. <laughs> Julian, you idiot. Look, he sat clopper at the table. <laughs> <laughs> Mr Penruthlin, what are you going to do with him? Well, I'm going to give him away to friends of mine. Lucky friends. Do they know how to work the front and back legs, sir? Oh, yes, they know fine. There's only one thing they don't know, though. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Well, they don't know how to... <laughs> <laughs> How do I do the zip? <laughs> <laughs> now, Mr. Penruthlin, behave yourself. Why don't you say straight out that you're giving Clopper to Julian and Dick? Gosh, are you really? Thank you very much. Uh, well, you, you got me what I wanted, so it's only fair I should give you what you wanted. Uh, Clopper's a funny one. See him looking at us now. He winked. I saw him wink. Where did he wink? <laughs> well, it wouldn't be surprising if he did wink. He's really had a most exciting time. This audio program is presented by Audible.com. Audible, audio that speaks to you wherever you are.